Hi and welcome to this episode of J Crimer Talk. Today we are discussing deaths in custody. Um, it was Rosalie's um, topic, but unfortunately she's not able to be with us today, so she'll be with us hopefully in the next couple of shows. We'll be able to see her again. Um, so without further ado, we've got Noshin. Hello. Hiya. And we've got Laura on the panel. Laura's back. Hello. <laughs> I'm sure you've all missed me. How would you define the notion of deaths in custody then? Well, I would say, um, from my perspective, deaths in custody would be once the criminal justice system has taken custody of a person, i.e. once their liberty to leave has been removed. So it could be whilst they've, been, uh, whilst they've already been arrested, it could be whilst they're in custody at the police station, being held overnight in a cell... It could be, of course, in prison, whether on remand or whether um, or, or while sentenced. Being really, really kind of pedantic and, and being really specific about it, I obviously wouldn't class capital punishment as being a death in custody. I would put that under a different different heading. Would you, you consider? Um, would you consider? You know, with regards to deaths in custody um, and your definition of it. Um, would you consider the immigration being held in custody um, through the immigration and other forces as well as as well as, as, well as prisons um, and you know things like that yeah actually that's a, that's a really important point actually yeah um, I would say uh, if you're being held at a detention center then absolutely absolutely that would also be because the definition by inquest and um, the response I received from Roxanne when I went to, shall I say Dr Roxanne, sorry, um, when I went to interview her the other day, um, she did include the the idea of, you know, detention centres as a mm. whole as opposed to separate entities like prison or um, just police custody and things mm. like that. So um, what about you? What would no, you think? I, I agree with both of you. I think any form of custody, whether it's a detention centre, whether it's in prison or whether it's doing your trial or remand centre, any form of custody, any that's what death in custody covers, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I suppose the temptation for some people would be to remove immigration from that and see it as something that was somehow separate. Um, if they say, you know, deaths in custody should be perhaps limited to looking at citizens and that obviously if people haven't oh, right, already see, achieved yeah. the right to, to remain in, in this country, mm-hmm. they might put that into a different category. Personally, I would totally disagree with that, but I guess that might be where the, the, perception, yeah. Yeah, the need to yeah, kind like of where the that comes in. differences between custody through, f- through the criminal law mm-hmm. and custody through like immigration and that. Mm-hmm. So try Absolutely. to like get a different between the Yeah, two. but I think at the moment, I think it's all of it, like any form of death. Custody, that's mm, in custody. Yeah. Right, brings us to our next question. Um, so, is the idea of deaths in custody mainly a law or criminological concern, in your opinion? Before um, I get the responses, <laughs> sorry, um, I am going to be putting up audios and stuff um, in regards to what Rox- Dr. Roxanne um, responded with this. So, I'm only going to be giving snippets of the responses she's gave, but um, she did say it was a combination of both and her mm. full explanation i'm not going to air it out now but just keep your eyes peeled i'll put it underneath this video um but her full response about why it was a combination of both um explains what she thought but what do you think uh yeah i would i would definitely agree this combination of, of the two i'd say you know the legal when you think about it the, the law is so intertwined with most things to do with criminology i mean if, if, for example, if somebody does die in custody, their family have legal recourse. There has to be an inquest as a matter of law. Whether or not their killing was lawful will be mm-hmm. brought into question, possibly, if they, say, died at the hands of, of an officer or, or, or prison officer. Um, I would also say, as well, to, to the point that, that Nasheen just made, which is really important, um, that it's also a matter for immigration. I would say it's a matter for sociologists. It's a form of social imprisonment, whether it's justified or not, an arrest and, and detention in an, in an immigration centre. They're all forms of social control. Mm-hmm. So it's a matter yep. for so many different um, so many different disciplines. It's a political science question. It's a matter of it's a matter of political control. Your politics will very much dictate 
where you stand on it's things like very, very yeah. restraint. This, yeah. yeah, I thought that when I um, when I conjured up the question and I was speaking to um, Dr. Roxanne and when I was asking you mm. guys, uh, I sent you the email with the questions. I thought it is it's it's more than just law. It's more than yeah. just criminology. It's it's everything. It is is definitely politics. Um, because that comes crime and um, mm. punishment and prisons and um, custody. That always comes into question when you want to hear a political agenda or Obviously, a manifesto. Obviously, because it's the politics and the legislation that make the mm-hmm. law, mm. and that affects the deaths and it affects the criminal side as well. It so affects theory as yeah. well. Yeah, and we always think of well, politicians get a bad press and often justifiably so. But politicians often as well that will pioneer responses to deaths and injury in custody. I mean, when you think about the late Tony Benn, who I was a big fan of, um, he was really, really vocal on uh, getting getting justice for uh, you know minors who were protesting, who had been harmed physically and were really put in danger in, in police custody. So often, you know, day to day physically, you know, politicians will become involved. But you know, it's it's beyond even stuff. Like, I mean, like what we're doing right now, obviously, is a combination of criminology and media mm-hmm. as kind of um, public criminology. Um, it's you know it's 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 to do with media studies. It's to do with literature. It's kind of it's important for everyday everyday yeah. life. I would say. Mm-hmm. But you know, with politicians, I think there are policy makers. There's a difference between the policy makers and the politicians. Whereas the policy makers just make the laws and that. But I think the politicians come forward only when there's a big case that's caused. Do you not think that they're doing things? Do you not think okay not that they're doing things? that we don't see, but it's when the big cases occur yeah. that we realise like, that they're actually it's doing a, something. So it's a case of, oh, God, this is Popular policy, political. it's like yeah. public policy, anything that stands out with the public that's caused uh, outrage with the public, that's when the politicians will kind oh. of, like, step in and, like, mm-hmm. take over and be like, you know what, I this think, is I what we were... I beg to differ. I think that. that's an oh. excellent point, actually, that, that Janice just made. I think if you, if you look at the workings of Parliament, quite often there are... Um, you know, standing committees, which obviously carry on uh, um, all the time, and select committees that yeah. do look into things like police and, and parliamentary abuses. And I think Janice is absolutely right. When we look at what happened, okay, it's, it's slightly different. Obviously, you could deba- you could almost say that it's you know you could say it's very much linked. But when we look at what happened with Hillsborough and finally getting justice for the night. Sorry, I feel like I'm sitting with Andy- Dr. Roxanne again. She said that she mentioned <laughs> the same thing. Oh, really? yeah. <laughs> well, great minds think alike, Dr. Roxanne. Um, but. Um, you know, Andy Burnham had been campaigning really hard for justice for the 96, and then it eventually did get into the press, and he was sidelined to a certain degree. But to be fair, he had he had worked really, really hard. So I think that sometimes we can assume that they're only out for themselves, but a lot of politicians, and I'm no fan of the Tories, but on both sides of the aisle, they, they, they do sometimes try and do the right thing, and they yeah. can be campaigners as well as, as, well as career politicians. Like, I think when they need to, they do step in to make... try to steer the public in a certain way. Yep. And oh, that right. can be so, good or bad. Good or bad. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely the, the latter. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm going to vote, don't worry. <laughs> but um, Yes, please vote. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, this is, I'm not uh, advocating, but th- vote. I did ask Dr Roxanne, um, to what extent are deaths in custody an issue for the future of law? But with us being criminologists... Um, I'm going to flip that question and ask, to what extent do you think deaths in custody um, is an issue for the future of criminology? Ooh, I think, unfortunately, it's always going to be an issue. I think the, the prevalence of, um, of like, uh, you know, dash cam footage, and obviously where you have, like, um, a, a, a camera on, the, on your car or, um, you know, cameras attached to police helmets and that kind of thing, on the streets, I think, tends to be... Um, you know, we, we're hoping is going to improve the amount of debts out there on the street. But once people get into custody, it's a slightly different a matter. Different. I think as well, with regards to deaths in custody, a lot of them, unfortunately, are very taboo. We don't know what's going on behind yeah. the scenes. Us mm. being, you know, us living outside in the outside world, we don't really know what's going on behind until somebody dies, unfortunately, which is very bad. Um, and it's always too little, mm. too late. And I think in regards to um, criminal, the future of criminology actually getting research and statistics and mm. going out and studying things is going to become a lot more difficult. Um, I know I know we have, yeah. you know, we, we have our means of getting into th- um, institutions and prisons and things like that, but um, yeah. always ensuring that we've got the accurate results um, 
that are representative for that time is going to be quite difficult if yeah. we do continue to have I, I think you're issues right. Like and that. I think the, the other problem that we have as kind of like looking at this from, a, from an academic kind of perspective is that automatically, as, as people in general, but certainly as, as academic type of people, you always look for a logic. So you're always looking for, if someone's died in custody, you're looking for some kind of malice there. Mm -hmm. And actually, a lot of the time, I think it's about 90% incompetence. 90% of the time, it's incompetence. So if we look at the, the drastic underfunding in prisons at the moment, mm -hmm. and the fact that most prison officers don't have any mental health training no fault yeah. of their own they are not required to have it so you know you can you can bash people for, for doing a bad job or for you know dealing with people too roughly and sometimes they are but most of the time it's a training issue it's not yeah. these individuals and when you look at the the amount of people that suffer from mental health problems in prison and it's only getting worse and mental health issues in this country only seem to be getting yeah. worse I see it as being a huge issue in criminology mm -hmm. going forward mm -hmm. and like, I think it's a lot of it's going to be incompetence. Yeah. Even if you train up the police officers for mental health, you can't avoid certain deaths. There will always be a certain amount of deaths. But then we can still try and keep the rate we can. low. We mm. can. We can try, but is it a topic that's avoidable? Definitely, not. definitely not. No, definitely not. And and it's it's this really interesting question. It's quite often like if you talk about things, uh, if, for example, if you talk about the the uh, the bad conditions in British prisons, you always have a person, whether it's an academic, whether it's um, you know just a, a friend you're talking to, whatever, who will turn around and say to you, "But have you looked at the conditions in America?" Have yeah, but it's not about yeah. yeah, yeah. And so we we're always kind of fighting against this, but we have improved things so much. So why don't of course, our answer is we don't want to stop there. We've all looked at um, the Sean Rigg and Thomas Orchard cases. We will have, we will have the link posted um, if you want to have a further read um, and further information about it and if you want to join in on the discussion. But they were both mentally ill and they were both in um, custody <clears throat> and they both died, unfortunately. Um, but my question to you guys um, about both cases and, and any similar cases that um, are out there, because there are more, but do you think there's enough in regards to um, how <clears throat> detention centres and um, centres of custody assist people with mental health? Um, there's, a lack, there's clearly a lack of understanding, cause may, or do you think um, because of the lack of understanding they could have prevented these deaths? I, I think that... It's very difficult to say whether these, whether for absolutely certain whether these deaths are preventable. If you think about someone in a different situation, you think about a security guard, I don't know, a teacher with a particularly violent student, you would never ever restrain somebody like that. You just mm -hmm. wouldn't do it. Um, I think mental health issues are a, um, a very big problem, as I said, you know, previously. People are not necessarily those who come into contact with with those who are mentally ill aren't necessarily trained in that. And as you know, as I said, it's not necessarily their fault. Mm -hmm. um, but but the fact is that people still end up in very unfortunate circumstances, sometimes even losing their lives. As well as as looking at um, deaths which are caused by other people in custody, when you look at mental health issues, you're also looking at um, possibly avoidable self-inflicted deaths. So either deliberate suicides or self-harm, which is accidentally taken too far. So you might have someone who <coughs> intends to cut their wrist and actually ends up slitting that their could wrist do with instead. Um, you could do, um, link that with security levels as well, yeah. because if you think about how much contraband is getting into places, or mm. um, realist, in a realistic world, there should be no ability for anyone to be able to commit mm. suicide in um while they're in custody. Yeah, certainly not anyone who's shown any signs yeah, of it. Yeah, of anyway, course, yeah. Absolutely. So if, you, can, you know, if you've got your mental yeah. health issues, there should be more um, actions implemented to ensure that, you know, you've definitely not got anything that of use. You know, a pen in prison, that's <laughs> very risky. But, you know, a, say a mental health patient with a pen in prison, they could use it for any unfortunate reasons. And I um, think we, we can't really go through the whole of this topic without mentioning the, the fact that, um, obviously, Sean Riggs in, Riggs in particular, this is obviously relevant to, um, that people involved in so the Black Lives Matter movement feel very much so that this is disproportionately affecting the BME community. Mm -hmm. That this is not, this is something, yes, that sometimes happens to white people, but it more often happens to, um, to BME citizens. And one of the first things, if you search for statistics on people um, in prison, that comes up is the the, the difference um, between the number of people, the number of BME prisoners versus the number of white prisoners. 
and the number of BME prisoners who end up dying in custody versus number of... Number but of it stems prisoners. from the whole initial process, really, with, in, with regards to race relations. I think that's something we need to... Uh, one, one day we can one pick day. that up on yeah, a show. Yeah, that's probably a topic. Yeah, a, definitely a, a hot topic. topic. That's a topic for five shows. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but no, um, there, there's there's many disproportions between, like, with race relations and crime, mm. um, and that's definitely something um, worth picking up. So in regards to deaths, deaths in custody stops and searches um cautions i'm just trying to think off the top of my head sentences um all that kind of stuff yeah there are um disproportions unfortunately um cps are disproportionately more likely to carry a case forward against a bme Mm -hmm. uh, against a bme suspect even if that case is later thrown out of court yeah Yeah. cps are basically pressing charges and bringing cases to court where the judge then feels they have insufficient evidence mm-hmm. and it's been allowed to get to that stage disproportionately as compared to white suspects and there's got to be something wrong Definitely with it. a show in the... Um, so if anyone's got any interest in any race relations or anything to do with crime and race relations, just, uh, you know, social media. Thank you. Um, anything you believe that may decrease uh, the deaths in custody rates? I think, like we've just mentioned, pers- training for mental health, uh, dealing with, like... In like in the Sean Riggs case, they held him for eight minutes, even after having handcuffed him within thirty seconds. They took they, I don't know. Maybe the police officer just looked at him as a normal prisoner, but to what extent? At what point do they stop? Yeah. At what point do they look at them different? So I think definitely there needs to be a lot more training for men to deal with mental health issues. And I also, I don't, I personally don't think that anyone who suffers from a mental health issue should be going to a prison because they need help. And obviously mm. that help, as we can see, is not provided in a mm. police. I think a part of, the, sorry, before you, we, we yeah. uh, move on to Laura, uh, <coughs> I think part of the issue is we're in a society now where everyone's equal, but not everyone's the same. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, a, a bit of a conflict between that because we're getting told, yeah, we're all the same, but then there's, you know, we have different needs and then there's different treatments. Yeah. So I think with regards to mental health, it's very, it's, 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 it's amazing that, you know, we're doing all we can um, to get agencies and charities out there to help people with mental health. But we do need to recognise that people do have mental health. So yeah. there are, you have to, we have to distinguish that there are times where, you know, we have to recognise it and we can't just treat them as though they haven't, even though we're trying to feel inclusive, if that, yeah. if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's, there's a time and a place for certain things and, and <laughs> having someone with mental health in custody is not the time to say to them, to make them fit. Okay, I don't want to say make them feel, but have them think, oh yeah, I'm just the same, and this this treatment's acceptable. You know, we have yeah. to, you know, I think more when it comes to inclusion and things like that. If if it's it's to uplift them and to motivate mm. someone with mental health, not in in a condition like, like that. To I think, get oh, it's it. Okay, like to it's a you around. great idea, equality for everyone. Yeah, but when you c- put it into practice, it's, it's not a very difficult. It's, it's difficult. Not as black and white as it exactly. Seems. I think um, I, I agree largely with what you said about the idea of diverge, diverging, sorry, <laughs> diverting um, mentally ill prisoners out of the system. I agree with that totally for people with things like very severe bipolar, for schizophrenia. I think it'd be nigh on, nigh on impossible to divert everyone out of yeah. the mm-hmm. out yeah, of of a prison system who is mentally ill because we have so many prisoners with personality disorders, with anxiety, with depression. Some people go in there I think it, le- it depends on the level yeah, of yeah. Say, yeah. prison causes these things. So I would I would like to see more staff full stop in prisons, better facilities for prisoners. Yeah. I'd like to see more prisoners diverted out of the system, um, more fully trained mental health professionals working with. Laura for Prime well. Minister. Laura yeah. Prime Minister. <laughs> and also, uh, I, I think what's also really important is that we re-examine what makes somebody. Um, not guilty by virtue of of Mm -hmm. mental health problems Mm -hmm. because at the moment we've got this weird weird system whereby we effectively say if you knew what you were doing was wrong by society standards then you can be hard you're sane well if you're if you're a paranoid schizophrenic who believes that the devil will kill him if he doesn't do something that he knows he can't do in front of a police officer the fact that you wouldn't do it in front of that police officer 
doesn't mean that you doesn't yeah, mean that you you know that you don't genuinely think that you're in some kind of danger. So I think that really we need to re-examine uh, you know fundamentally and coming back come back as well to what um, you said with Dr. Roxanne with the legal uh, yeah, criminology yeah. being so close together. We need to be re-examining how our laws treat mentally ill people. Mm -hmm. Never mind our criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think at the moment it, it's only diminished responsibility, isn't it, mm -hmm. that they deal with? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Not guilty only, but yeah, yeah. that's the least responsibility. Yeah. That's um, and of course you can be um, sent to a psychiatric ward instead of a prison. Yeah. And people often are diverted. Some of our most famous prisoners sometimes are diverted out, like mm -hmm. for example Ian Brady, who's sent to prison, um, found guilty and, and not found, you know, not even pleaded insanity, but then removed and sent to Ashworth Medical Center. Well, yeah. 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 Um, that brings us to the end of the, our questions um, regarding deaths in custody. If there's any concerns or any stories or any headlines, um, I did actually read another case on Kingsley Borough um, and he died in custody. I didn't actually bring that up during the show. But if you personally have anything you want discussing, um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, just find us and contact us or you can contact us by email. Um, and if there's any points that Laura, No Sheen, or myself said, and you disagree with strongly, we're all here for it. So, um, or if you agree, yeah. Or if you agree, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much everything. But thank you very much for watching, and keep a lookout for our updates. <laughs>